Hello and welcome to NPTEL MOOC on Applied Electromagnetics for Engineers. In this module, we will look at wave propagation inside a ferrite medium. Ferrites are made out of ferrimagnetic materials and they are extremely important for many applications in microwave devices and optical systems. Okay. They are used to make uh, phase shifters, circulators, isolators, uh, other kind of uh, elements, um, you know, uh, polarization rotators, polarization switches. So, there is a lot of these applications that are that use ferrites. They are also used in eddy current, you know, minimization by laminating the ferrite, uh, laminating the core of the ferromagnetic materials. And what we will do is to consider a simplified ferrite analysis. Okay. The reason is that ferrites are highly complicated materials to describe in one 30 minute module, but I would just like to give you what is the physical principle involved and discuss one of the most important effect that you would observe as the wave propagates inside a ferrite material called as Faraday effect. This is not the same as Faraday's law, but this is a different effect which he observed experimentally and later on of course, people theorized as to what is happening by looking at the properties of ferrites. Now, one very distinguishing feature of magnetic material is that their value of mu will not usually be a constant mu 0. Okay. If you are lucky, the medium will have a different value of the relative permeability mu r, but it would be constant. But in a ferrite, it turns out that the value of mu becomes a tensor. Just as you had a dielectric anisotropic materials, you will now have magnetic anisotropic materials, okay, where epsilon will be fixed that will be a constant, but it is mu which turns out to be a tensor. However, the propagation is not essentially the same, whereas dielectric anisotropic tensors or dielectric anisotropic materials such as calcium crystals or calcite crystals had this property of non you know reciprocity that is you take a crystal whether you connect it this way or this way did not really matter. Okay. If you send in a linearly polarized light, you would get a circularly polarized light at the output provided you have chosen the lengths and other things correctly. But if you turned it around and then send light in on this side or if you take the crystal in the same way, but send light from the other direction, it would still undergo a circular rotation okay, or circular polarization change. So, this property that it know it does not depend on what direction the initial input and the output are taken is called as a reciprocal device. Okay. Whereas, in a ferrite media you really cannot do that. Okay. It turns out that the Faraday effect that you observe in a ferrite material okay, uh, you know is actually non reciprocal. In fact, this non reciprocity is very important when realizing an isolator, polarization independent isolators or a circulator and so on, okay, both at the microwave frequencies as well as at the optical frequencies. So, these, these ferrites are very important and what we will do is to first give you very few I basic ideas, okay, uh, kind of a physical idea as to what is the origin of this type of a permeability tensor okay, uh, and then see what is the ramification of that as the wave plane wave propagates through the ferrite media. Okay. Ferrites are magnetic materials and all magnetism Okay, that you observe is strictly quantum mechanical. That is to say, there is no classical analogy for this magnetic materials because magnetic material source, the magnetism property source actually comes from the spin of the electrons. Okay. In a single atom, maybe think of a hydrogen atom, you have a electron which is orbiting the nucleus. Okay. This is a simplified presentation, so do not really bother about the classical picture or something, but you essentially see that this electron can be you know once it is orbiting then there be it is like equivalent to a tiny current flowing in a loop. Okay. And whenever a current flows in a loop, there will be a magnetic moment associated with that. Just as you have two charges separated plus and minus constituting what is called as a electric dipole. Okay. Similarly, a current moving in a loop okay uh, you know more moving around a circle constitutes what is called as a magnetic dipole moment okay and in a sample in a magnetic material you will actually find many many you know lot and lot of these magnetic moments okay so so most people thought you know before the discovery of electron spin most people thought that the the magnetization that you would see of the magnetic materials was actually because of this orbital movement Okay. So, orbital magnetic moment is what was thought to have given rise to 
magnetism. But it turns out that when you actually take a sample, the contribution from the orbital magnetic moment is almost negligible compared to the contribution made by the spin. Okay. In fact, this difference between the spin and the spin uh, contribution of the to the magnetic moment and the magnetic moment contribution to the orbital angular momentum experimentally was later on used to say that electrons and any other particle actually possesses spin and spin is strictly a quantum mechanical property. Okay. It is the intrinsic property of all particles and it does not really have a uh, classical analogy to it. The closest one can think of is that of a spinning top or your earth which is spinning on its own axis, but do not stretch this analogy too far because it is not exactly correct. Okay. And these spins in a magnetic material actually line up when you apply an external magnetic field they will line up. Now, depending on how these spins in the adjacent sites are located, you will have ferromagnetic materials in which the spins are all of identical way that is they are all either up or down. Okay. So, they all adjacent ones will have the same spin direction and anti ferromagnetic materials are the ones in which if the one spin or in one side the spin is up the other side the spin is down the strength of up and down are equal therefore, there is no net uh, in this one. Whereas, in a ferrimagnetic material the anti -mag ferromagnetism type of you know configuration exists, but then the strength of the other spin right is not completely equal. So, it is it is what we call as a uncompensated spin chain. Okay. So, because of this uncompensated spin chain ferrites you know exhibit uh, the so whatever the material magnetic material that they exhibit magnetic moment magnetic properties that they exhibit. Okay. As I said it is not the orbital angular momentum that is important for us, but the spin angular momentum the momentum because of the angular momentum because of the spin of an electron which as I said is an intrinsic property which you can think of as a spinning top or a spinning earth, but as I want do not stretch the analogy too much. Okay. The spin angular momentum it turns out you cannot take on any arbitrary value that you want okay, because it is actually quantized it can only take on the value of plus or minus h bar by 2. Okay. So, in a single electron situation the spin is either up that is plus h bar by 2 or it is down minus h bar by 2. We are not really interested whether it is up or down because in a ferry magnetic material we know that one will be up the other will be down. Okay. The same effect you would obtain if the plus strength was more or the minus strength was more essentially more or less. So, we do not really bother with that and this spinning electron also possesses a magnetic moment as I said not because of the orbital angular momentum, but because of the spin itself and this spin angular momentum is actually given by q h bar divided by 2 m where m is the mass of the electron how much is the mass of the electron 9.1 into 10 to the power minus 31 kilogram approximately correct. Q is the charge of the electron which is 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb. Uh, since the charge of an electron is what we are considering this charge has to become negative. You will see that because this is negative the vectors corresponding to m and s will actually be oppositely directed. Okay. H is of course, the Planck's constant. I do not remember the value of Planck's constant I believe it is if the order of 10 to the power minus 34 right. So, joules per second square something like that. So, if you actually look at uh, you know uh, the ratio of the magnetic moment because of the spin to the actual value of the spin itself this ratio is called as the gyro magnetic ratio or the gyro magnetic ratio or simply the gyro ratio okay, or gyro ratio does not matter how you pronounce that one and this turns out to be a very large number this is approximately in the order of 10 to the power 11 coulomb per kilograms. Okay. So, there was a dot here let me remove the dot. So, this is about 10 to the power 11 coulomb per kilo uh, gram. Okay. The analogy or the geometric way of thinking about this as I told you not strictly correct, but reasonably okay, is that you have an externally applied magnetic field let us take this direction of the applied magnetic field to be along the z axis. Then you have a spinning electron. Okay. So, you have an electron which is now spinning. Okay. So, let us say this is the spin of an electron. This spin of an electron will actually have a magnetic moment. Okay. So, this is the magnetic moment. So, this magnetic moment will in turn actually presses around the 
applied magnetic field H0. So, we have said that H0 will be along the z direction and this magnetic moment will actually precess around or it will revolve around this H0 while the electron itself spins giving rise to a spin vector s. Okay. So, the spin vector s whose value or magnitude is h bar by 2 and the magnitude of m which is given by m by gamma as we have already seen are actually oppositely directed. Okay. The angle of precision is given by the angle between h 0 and the magnetic moment. Okay. In fact, you can obtain a simple equation that relates this m and the magnetic field h 0 by realizing that whenever there is a current loop or you know whenever there is a magnetic moment let us not say current loop whenever there is a magnetic moment the torque on the magnetic moment is actually given by m cross b where b is the applied magnetic field. So, if the applied magnetic field b or along h is given and the magnetic moment direction or the magnetic moment vector m is known then the torque experienced by this magnetic moment which you can picture in the form of a loop okay, will actually be given by the cross product between m and b okay, or the vectors m and b. Since b is mu naught into h which we have assumed here, so this will be mu naught m bar into h. Okay. So, this is mu naught m bar into h is the torque, but classical mechanics tells us that torque is nothing but rate of change of the angular momentum. So, you have d s by d t which is the rate of change of the spin angular momentum okay, which will be equal to the torque that the electron is actually experiencing. And if you now substitute for s as m by gamma with an appropriate sign of minus you will actually see that this is given by minus 1 by gamma d m by d t. Obviously, this must be then equal to mu naught m cross h. So, you actually have a simple equation d m bar by d t where this is the magnetic moment vector to be equal to minus gamma mu 0 m cross h. This is for a single isolated electron or a single isolated atom, but in a sample there will be many such electrons or many such atoms. right? So, in that case you do not really want to talk about a magnetic moment of one electron, second electron and so on. right? So, you want to do some sort of a macroscopic theory or kind of an average out of a thing. right? So, if the density of atoms is some n, then you can define a magnetization, the macroscopic magnetization m as n into small m vector. That is, if the number of atoms is some number per unit volume, multiplying that one by m will give you so and so many number of magnetic moments per unit volume. Therefore, this capital M the magnetization can also be thought of as moment density vector. Okay. In a given volume the total magnetic moment can then be written as m vector times d v where d v is the integral uh, volume integral of this one. Okay. So, this is the equation that we would like to use. So, instead of working with the small m we will be working with the capital M. So, you have the magnetization vector d m by d t satisfying a same relationship minus mu naught gamma, gamma is the gyro ratio times m cross h naught. Please note that this m is the macroscopic magnetization. Okay. Now, that we have set up an initial h 0, okay, we want to solve this equation. You can solve the equation, I would not solve that. So, if you do that, in fact, what you would observe is that this would be the magnetization magnitude vector okay? and when you project this m vector onto the x y plane and you observe how this m actually changes with respect to time. Okay? So, you have on this left hand side m as a function of t, the right hand side can be assumed to be having h 0 the applied external magnetic field which is a constant. So, you can actually solve this equation for the components m x, m y and m z and you will see that this m z is actually going to be a constant okay. m z the z component the projection of the magnetization vector on the z component will be a constant this is where the direction of h is. Okay. Whereas, m x and m y which are the projection of m on the x y plane. right? So, I should have probably written in a slightly better way. Let me try this again. So, I can write this as, so this is the x axis, this is the y axis. So, when you project it, you will actually see that there is an m x term and an m y term. 
right. So, there is an m x and an m y term may be this the other way around does not matter. So, the projection of this component will also be changing and in fact, it will actually trace out a circle ok as m precesses around as m precesses around this h 0 with a certain precession angle of theta the corresponding projection at different values will actually turn out to be points on a circle and this circle has an amplitude of a. So, your m x is given by some a cos omega t and m y will be given by a sin omega t with the precession angle now determined by m x square plus m y square which is the projection of the value of m on the x y plane to the overall value magnitude of m. Okay. So, this equation gives you what is the precision angle. It turns out that if there is no damping in the system, if the system is completely lossless and this is the only equation that is governing, then this m will continue to you know precess around the d c value h 0. Okay. In practice what happens is that it would not continuously uh, keep precessing, but it kind of spirals down and then eventually aligns itself with h 0. So, all magnetic moments eventually align themselves with h 0 and as the strength of h 0 is increased more and more number of magnetic dipole moments align and the value of m starts to increase the capital M starts to increase until there are no more moments to align. Okay. So, at that point m becomes the saturation value or m saturates to what is called as a saturation value of m s. Okay. Now, by solving this equation you can actually show that this precision frequency which is sometimes called as the Larmor precision frequency or the Larmor frequency is actually proportional to h 0 it is given by mu gamma h 0 where gamma you know uh, it can be thought of as the magnitude of gamma h 0 is the amplitude real. So, this frequency of omega 0 given by mu mu naught actually mu naught gamma h naught is called as the Larmor precision frequency or uh, Larmor frequency or simply the precision frequency. Okay. So, far we had assumed that h 0 was a DC value, but what happens if in addition to h 0 which is a DC value I will also apply some AC component. Okay. So, if I apply some AC component to this sorry this should have been shown as you know applied along h 0. So, what happens if I apply a AC component I mean you could apply it along h 0 or you could apply it in the x y plane what happens is that the total magnetization m will actually now split into two parts one will be the saturation magnetization because you normally drive ferrites with a saturation magnetization that is you have applied sufficiently large bias field so that the moments have all kind of aligned themselves okay so you have ms z hat plus m now i am using this m to denote the AC magnetization. Okay, I am not using this to denote the total magnetization. This is just the AC magnetization. Remember, MS is the result of applying a large DC bias field, and we have applied this large DC bias field along the Z direction. Okay, so this is what happens, and you can go back and solve the previous equation, which was that dm bar by dt was equal to minus mu naught gamma into m cross h right. So, you can solve this equation for the total magnetization now with h being you know decomposed into the DC bias plus the AC component and what you will actually observe is that m will be written or m can be written in terms of h x and h y which are the AC components of h as chi x x chi x y chi y x chi y y into h a c where h a c will be h x and h y m which is the a c component will be m x and m y vectors. Okay. So, this particular matrix form wherein this chi x x x y y x and y y okay, again it has to be in the situation that the x x values are equal to each other okay, whereas, y x is not equal to each other they, they are actually conjugate variables. So, this matrix is kind of a conjugate matrix. Now, this is m you can obtain from m the relationship between b h and m is b equal to mu naught h plus m. So, you can substitute for m in terms of h a c in this case and then show that your mu vector. So, the effectively you can write this as mu times h where mu with a double you know bar over the top will tell you that this is actually a tensor 
quantity. Okay. The value of this x x y y is not important, but it will actually be easy to calculate for you. Once you solve the equation, we will not look at that uh, solution at this point, but when you write that uh, in, when you solve it, you will see that it is actually very easy. So, you will have omega 0 omega m by omega 0 square minus omega m square. This is again for the off diagonal elements, this is given by j omega omega m. Omega is the applied frequency and omega 0 is the precision frequency omega m is equal to gamma mu 0 m s which is the saturation frequency. Okay. So, you can solve and find out this relationship with the fact or with the overall effect that mu has now become a tensor and what is the form of the mu tensor given that we have applied the field the bias field along the z axis this will be given by mu j kappa 0 minus j kappa mu 0 0 0 mu naught. Okay. Of course, if the field is if the electromagnetic wave is propagating along the z direction you are not interested in all the 9 elements here, but you are only interested in this sub matrix which then couples the L x and the y components of your magnetic or the electric fields E x E y or H x and H y. Okay. So, this is the effective permittivity and permeability and we have seen that permeability actually becomes a tensor which we have now represented in terms of a matrix. Okay. We have already seen that the there is a precision of an angle theta and suppose we send in a right hand circularly polarized wave into the ferrite. Okay. Right hand circularly polarized wave is what we send into the ferrite. I will not show the details here, I will leave this as an exercise for you. What happens when you uh, you know write down the expressions is that the precision frequency actually increases because you no know, we have already applied the DC field and we have applied AC field. So, when you send in the right hand circularly polarized light into this ferrite medium the value of theta actually increases meaning that the precision angle actually increases. So, we will call this as some theta m or some overall theta with the fact that remember originally this was precising in this particular direction correct and now you have a precision in the same direction. So, sending in a right hand circularly polarized wave has caused the precision angle to increase while keeping the same direction. So, H naught the bias field that you have applied causes the magnetization to precess, it will be precessing in some direction. Sending in a right hand circularly polarized wave will actually make or sending in a right hand circularly polarized magnetic field will actually make the precision angle increase and in the same direction. Okay. Whereas, if you send in a left hand circularly polarized wave into the ferrite what happens is that the precision angle actually reduces. So, you might actually start with the, the h 0 to set up the precision you know and this is actually precessing around this particular way, but now the result of sending in a LHCP wave is that the precision angle reduces moreover the precision direction turns out to be different. Okay. So, the precision earlier if it was clockwise now it becomes anti clockwise. Okay. So, these are the effects of polarization. So, depending on what polarization of the wave that you send in your precision angle, amount of precision, direction of precision everything can change. Okay. So, clearly this is some sort of a non isotropic effect and that is all happening because of the coupling elements j kappa and minus j kappa. Okay. So, what we now do is to go over quickly to understand how a plane wave propagates inside an infinite medium. I would not carry through the analysis, I will direct you to appropriate exercises and references. The idea is that we assume mu to be a tensor, as I said the interesting part is only this particular thing, uh, the sub mu that you are interested in and we will assume that we are propagating a plane wave. So, it is a plane wave propagating along the z direction clearly both E z as well as H z components for this one must be equal to 0. And then what happens is if you now write down the corresponding Maxwell's equations right. So, you have a certain assumed value of beta and then when you write down the Maxwell's equation and proceed in a manner that was similar to what we did in the uh, dielectric anisotropic case, you will see that beta will turn out to have two different values. There we had beta z 1 and beta z 2, here you will have beta plus and beta minus and beta plus is given by omega square root mu plus kappa times epsilon. So, clearly this is larger 
than what beta minus would be because beta minus is actually given by mu minus kappa into epsilon. We are assuming that mu and kappa are real numbers in this case. Okay. So, you clearly see that beta plus is greater than beta minus. So, what happens is that pictorially if I were to show supposing you had a wave propagating along the z axis and you had an initially polarized wave along the x axis. Okay. Then what happens because of beta plus and beta minus okay, is that in a ferrite medium unlike the dielectric anisotropic medium the eigen uh, this one or the normal modes are not the linearly polarized ones, but they are the circularly polarized ones. Okay. We will not discuss about that, but you can take it off uh, from the exercises out there Th with the result that these circular polarized modes Okay, any linear polarization can be thought of as superposition of two circular polarization modes okay. and these circular polarization modes remember will react differently as they propagate through the ferrite with the result that once you set up your uh, bias field let us say along z direction and the plane wave is also propagating along the same direction then the wave actually will rotate its polarization it would be linearly polarized it would not become circularly polarized it will be linearly polarized but the phase angle of this one would be in such a way that it becomes more and more negative or look from the z direction positive z direction along the way that is propagating this would look like a counter clockwise propagation okay so there is a counter clockwise propagation okay but if the direction of propagation is along minus z direction okay you still have your x and y axis in the same way. So, you have x and y and if you now imagine that you again start with an initially linearly polarized light along x axis down the line, okay, down the line what happens is that this wave would again move in the same manner as the forward wave. We can actually put down the equations and show that while phi becomes negative the angle through which this rotates becomes negative it would be the same case for this one this case it is z is negative. Okay. So, you will see that whether the light goes first into from z equal to 0 to some distance and then comes back. So, in this way it picks up a phase or the linear polarization change of an angle phi. It will also pick up the same linear polarization change of phi. So, that in one round trip you actually obtain a total phase change of 2 phi okay. and if you take phi to be equal to pi by 4 then you start with a linearly polarized light once it goes pi by 4 once it reflects and comes back there is an additional pi by 4 phase rotation which actually means pi by 2. So, which means the light would come out parallel polarization if you start with a perpendicular polarization and this effect is called as Faraday effect and the amount of phi that picks up the change in the polarization that happens is actually proportional to the difference between beta plus and beta minus as well as the length of the medium itself okay. and this is non reciprocal. No matter you go like this and come back the total polarization angle will not go back to 0 it will actually double than the single direction of propagation. So, this non reciprocal effect is the one that is used in making isolators, circulators and other microwave and optical properties. Thank you very much.